it's quite important and spoken at multiple forums as well is the role of technology in enabling the development sector uh something that uh, many of us in the audience are quite passionate about are keen to know from two of the stalwarts uh, uh if i may use that word uh, who've been there done that in massively scaling successful models uh at huge scale uh it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's moderator uh mr puneet pushkarna uh who is the chairman emeritus of uh, tai singapore and is also on the board of uh, uh many early stage you know, ventures uh in india and otherwise uh mr puneet i'm going to keep the introduction short in the interest of time and i i leave the floor to you to welcome the panelists and kick off this discussion for us over to you mr puneet thank you shriram thank you very much and thank you to the naj forum for organizing this thing I have two very distinguished titans of the corporate industry with me over here, my very good friend Pramod Bhasin and Arundhati Bhattacharya. Uh, let me just do a brief introduction. Uh, let me start with Pramod. Pramod spent 25 years with GE, working in the US, UK, Asia, came to India when, as what he says, most people knew India only through the rope tricks. That's why India was born in the West. and set up ge capital intrepid man took that public changed the name to genpack um, and has built a organization that's over 100 plus 1000 uh, strong he, uh, he bought back ge capital you have to learn this thing only from promote he bought back ge capital in 2016 it's called clicks capital and he also runs actually asha impact which is a virtual fund focused on social uh, impact he is the co-founder of skills academy skills academy has trained over 50000 students mostly in the rural area and what's impressive is that these students have actually gone on to find some great jobs he sits on a number of different boards on dlf on srf on ndtv he has been the chairman of nascom i he is a strategic advisor to kedara and last i would just add if, that he also was a my co-conspirator at tai I sat with me on the Thai Global Board and was the president of Thai NCR. Uh, let me go to Arundhati. Arundhati, uh, a very visible face. She spent four decades in SPI and really converted SPI into a, re a real powerhouse, a public sector bank that I think did phenomenally well. Uh, she went on to become the first chairperson, the, the women chairperson of State Bank of India. she then actually currently is the chairperson and ceo of salesforce she sits on a number of different boards including reliance industries she's also the chairperson of swift and in the past she has been sitting on the boards of organizations like wipro peramal etc uh, i think she's had many notable mentions and i will just mention two uh, she was in the world's 100 most powerful women by forbes and she was also uh as a 50 greatest leaders cited by fortune so welcome pramod and arunati lovely to have both of you over here let me start actually even though the topic today is the role of technology but let me actually step back uh, before we actually get to technology and arunati let me start with you uh, what you what do you think how can business be a platform for change before because before we get to technology how do you think that business can be a platform for change uh before we jump into the technology part and then maybe talk about if you do feel the technology is good for it then what the, how can technology impact that okay so first of all thank you and i would uh, like to wish the nudge foundation the very best uh, for uh, making this enormous effort on this uh, independence day and i'm very glad that i'm able to do my very little part in this whole thing Uh, i hope you are okay with a long answer because you asked me a question that is very difficult to answer in a few words uh, you know business being a platform for change i think you know i have been lucky enough to be in two businesses both of which were great platforms for change so if i start with my current one which is my role in salesforce india salesforce actually believes that business is a platform for change and the way they go about doing this is they have the philanthropy model of a one by one by one which means they donate every year 1% of their equity or profits 1% of their pro of their products 
and 1% of our time. So, you know, uh, the workers in Salesforce actually get paid time off, one whole paid time off to go and do volunteering work. 1% of our products are given to the non-profit sector at no cost. And in fact, many of our volunteers spend time teaching these uh, non-profit sector enterprises how to use those licenses and thereby make their operations more efficient. And of course, as I said, we make direct grants, which is to the extent of 1% of our profits or equity. So, you know, this, uh, this platform is only available because we have a solid business behind it. And this effort is being carried forward. Now there is a 1% club. And Salesforce is actually the founder, member, and champion for this 1% club. And now there are 9,000 enterprises that have become members of this club, including companies like Yelp and many others. So they have all become member of this one by one by one giving model, philanthropy model. And therefore, you know, business really is making a appreciable dent or appreciable its, um, contribution for change in society. So that's as far as Salesforce goes. But if I go back to my uh, earlier assignment in the bank, even in the bank, you know, a bank, for instance, the way it works and the places in which it works, it can impact lives hugely. So lives and livelihoods, they can only be made if you are able to finance them at the right time. And I think, you know, therefore in the bank, in fact, I used to tell my people, that where will you actually get paid for serving the way you're getting paid in a bank? So I think, you know, banks can make enormous differences in people's lives, especially in a place like India, where we do banking not only in the metros or in the cities, but we do banking in the deep reaches, you know, in the very far reaches of the country, including in places like the islands of the Andaman Islands or, you know, as high as Kargil and Lake. So, you know, we are there everywhere and we are empowering people through the finance that we are giving them. Besides that, of course, State Bank also used to donate 1% of its pro uh, profits. For, it's been doing that for a very long time for community services. And there again, you know, we could actually set up the foundation during my time. And with the foundation, what happened was we could actually collaborate with a large number of other larger organizations to bring together really large projects that created an impact. So I think, you know, there is no doubt in anybody's mind at all that business is a platform for change. And really speaking, if you look at the world today, consumers are actually aligning behind businesses that display a certain value. They display that they work by certain values, they live by certain values, and consumers automatically align behind these businesses. So I think, you know, there is a very a good synergy between having the right values and ensuring your business is sustainable. And that is how the business itself realizes that it's for everybody's good that they become a platform for true change, for bringing about the right kind of changes that ensures that a society, the entire society gets uplifted. Thank you. Thank you, Arundhati. Pramod, can I uh, have you chip in? and A, a repartee to what Arundhati said, and then B, perhaps to address really the technology element of it. You know, there's, uh, for us to leverage technology uh, and to build businesses to scale, uh, how, how can that be done today? Uh, and, and again, I want to contextualize that in the social sector. Yeah, Puneet, hi, thank you for that. Really pleasure to be here and Thank you to the Nudge Foundation and Arundhati. Pleasure to share the podium here with you. I know a lot about you. I was the one who started the SBI credit card business in case you <laughs> did that deal with A.N. Varma many years ago and ran that for many, many years um, as, as well as board member, but uh, as part of GCAP. Um, so a few thoughts on this, which are perhaps a little different. Um, Clearly, you know, when you start something like the business process management industry, and we were the pioneers in it, it now employs over a million people across the country. And the profound effect it has had on employees across all the small towns of India, which is where we go out and recruit, has been exceptional. Uh, take that to other countries. Uh, China, we were the pioneers of this business. 
I started it in China, in Budapest, in Bucharest, in Guatemala, in Juarez, in um, Sao Paulo, in Colombia. And every one of these, you know, we were hiring people who were just coming out of colleges. This is not just call center stuff. We do very little call center, but this was mainly back office accounting, banking operation, etc. And empowering them, most of all in India, what was fantastic was the way it empowered women. 50% of our employees were women. And when we first started giving them jobs, bring them in from smaller towns, you know, having them come and work with us, um, training them for all the various roles. I think the empowerment they got out of that was quite phenomenal. I really will never remember how much money we made in Genpact. I will remember the friends we made, the people whose lives we touched. I think that's one side. I will say on the other side, though, that there has been a significant shift amongst global businesses to think a lot more about sustainability, about um, driving change, about driving change in the right areas beyond profits. Um, personally, I think it's vastly overdue. Look, I'm a, I'm a product of uh, capitalism, American capitalism, if I may say, from GE days, you know, in my own way. Um, but the fact is, I don't know that companies, major companies, which sit on billions of dollars of assets, do enough. They could do so much more. Um, I, have, I include uh, any company I have run also in that. And I think that change is happening. As Arundhati said, she started the foundation at SPI. Other companies started doing other things. But I honestly feel we should be and could be doing a hell of a lot more. The, the, the wonderful thing is, that technology today, which is what you wanted to refer to and we should talk about, is cheaper, more easily available, faster to deploy. You can fail faster. You can make mistakes faster. But it allows you to reach with distribution and scale in a way you could never do earlier. Um, so give me I'll give you a few examples, which is why I find the world of Develop, we run a social, a social impact fund, uh, a virtual fund with Asha Impact. Um, we invest in, you know, Vikram Gandhi and I are the founders of it. We invest in companies which are perhaps bottom of, uh, are serving the bottom of the pyramid, although there are so many companies in India which drive benefits to them that, you know, actually finding your niche there is quite easy. But for instance, look at healthcare. We're not going to solve the problems of healthcare in India by producing more doctors and, um, and then waiting for that to happen and then serving the people. We have a huge problem of reach. We have a huge problem of quality. We have a huge problem of delivery of medicines. Um, a lot of effort sometimes goes into hospitals. We forget that 90% of issues in healthcare are not in hospitals. They're in people's homes. That's where people sit. So technology is going to solve that in by providing medicines through drones, telemedicine practices, all of those things. So I really hope these things start taking off very fast and that actually the big businesses are the ones who can seed these investments and these experiments. Look at education, uh, look at financial inclusion. You know, microfinance was an astonishing effort which took off, um, really reached the heartland of many countries. It's, it's, it's there and was able to lend to people with new models that were truly going to replace uh, the existing, the old, you know, money lender models that they used to live with. And perhaps these are all the areas where perhaps banks couldn't go effectively and efficiently. And obviously banks have to be very conscious about that. But in financial inclusion, you could do the education. We're not going to be able to educate India thinking that we're going to open that many more schools. It is going to take a hybrid of online and offline work and that's the way we're going to be able to reach out to people. And, you know, this current COVID crisis has accelerated uh, digitization by three to five years, I think. So I think there's a chance for profound change. Artificial intelligence, Manit, one of the great things I've heard about artificial intelligence, and I disagree with all the notions about how it's going to destroy jobs. All technology, all through history has created jobs. Artificial intelligence is what gives rise to Uber and Ola and Oyo and everybody else. And all of those people have created jobs. It's a bit like de-licensing in India. You know, everybody was scared it would demolish local industry and all it did was expand the market. So artificial intelligence will bring, it, bring humanity back into jobs. 
is a wonderful expression of, I've heard because it will take away the back-breaking pain of very basic work and allow other stuff to happen um, in a way that is actually very, very effective, very efficient, and takes away the daily pain that people have to go through in other jobs. I'll stop there, but I'm very hopeful that technology really will give the Philippine development sector that it needs, because in the past, you know, India has something like 3 million NGOs, and yet they don't hit scale where most majority of the time, they don't have effectiveness the majority of the time. And I hope technology can be that binding factor. Yeah, no, I, I think so. I, I think we're, I think we're very, very hopeful. You know, we've all spent a lifetime in technology. If I didn't have belief and conviction that it was doing a better, it was for the better good, I wouldn't have done that. But, and I know you talked about uh, sustainability, but there's one issue, uh, Pramod, and that is that still it is extremely uneven, right? Uh, so how does that technology solve for inequality that exists in terms of access, in terms of affordability, in terms of learning? You know, uh, the United Nations has talked about uh, leaving, leaving no one behind. I know even Mo, uh, Prime Minister Modi has been talking about sabka saath, sabka vikas, sabka vishwas, etc. So maybe, uh, maybe I can turn this to Arundhati back, Arundhati, what do you think uh, and how can we solve this whole issues around inequality? So, you know, technology on the one hand is a huge enabler. If you just take, for instance, the matter of education, we know that, you know, the quality of education that you get in the rural areas or even in the municipal schools leaves much to be desired. However, if you use technology, you can actually deliver the best of educational materials right down to the last uh, rural outpost. Having said that, it, I'm not saying that while it can be done, that it is done or we are empowered to do it. And actually speaking, this pandemic has shown how the gap between the haves and have nots have opened up. Because as you know, today, most of the classes that are happening are online. Now, it, it's okay if you are in a home where you can find a corner to yourself and you have either a smartphone or a tablet, you can follow all of the classes. But imagine if you live in a one-roomed house and you already have a number of people around you and you don't have a smartphone and you don't have a tablet, how then are you going to follow those classes? So you're going to fall further and further behind. So the divide that we are seeing today between the haves and the have-nots is actually growing larger. And in fact, there is some research, I think, that was done in the J.F. Kennedy School in all probability, which actually said that government should be worrying more about opening schools than opening industry. Because if there is one year of education lost, then the people who are already behind are going to fall even further behind by one year. However, if this gap can be uh, can be taken up and solved for by the government, by creating enough infrastructure, by ensuring that connectivity is there right through up to the villages, that every student has a tablet, just as we are giving away cycles to students these days, that we give them a tablet, empower them with a tablet, then, you know, we are looking at a different scenario altogether. Because technology is one thing that will allow you to customize the lesson as per the learner's ability. It's that one difference that can be, that can really make, uh, you know, make or break the way you learn in the sense that, you know, we don't have to have classes where everything goes at the same pace, though the 50 students in the class all learn at different paces. Here with technology, we can at last, at long last, begin to customize the lessons in a manner so that each person can learn at their own pace. Not only that, the best of the inputs can actually be brought and served to whoever you are and wherever you are. So a true democratization of education can actually take place. But before that, you know, we need to have the backbone. We need to have the infrastructure. Because without that, this gap is only going to go up. It's not going to go down. You know, this understood. But also there's one uh, missing ingredient that we haven't talked about. And I think it's important to talk about that. 
And uh, I go back to promote. You talked about promote the, the true capitalist, uh, you know, uh, intent and market forces drive everything. And, I, and I, I understand that. But, you know, in this sector, somehow there is this need of um, innovation capital. Uh, and so how, how do we actually attract uh, this innovation capital, and I, and I don't. We don't need to actually stick to that label. You can put whatever label that you would like to do that. And I, of course, there is this whole question about, you know, does capital have a higher purpose than just profit, and how does this impact? So, really, in the development sector, what do you think? Uh, how can that uh, be, you know, attracted? And what do you think the deployment methods of that would be? Yes. No, I think it's a very important point, Puneet. Firstly, let me say, you know, look, in a country like India, unbridled capitalism is completely the wrong answer. I think you need both. I think you need the opportunity of free markets that they provide, but you need to balance them with a lot of support from the government on basic services, education, health, water, um, you know, very simple basic stuff has to be provided, broadband perhaps, as, as Arudhati is saying. Um, perhaps that could, you know, but... Again, if you look at that, the danger of that is that while you're trying to put Bharat net everywhere, um, it's not working as efficiently. It's harder to provide just because the government is ill-equipped to actually deliver services. What it is very good at is providing platforms. So what I hope they will do is provide the platforms that they have like Aadhaar and other platforms, provide a healthcare platform of which you can innovate, provide many other areas where uh, you can innovate freely and openly and allow people to build off the platforms that you have, perhaps tinkering labs that have been set up. Perhaps those are platforms that people can use in ways on which they can work on top of them to provide innovation and provide new startups. You know, the startup movement is huge and I think it's probably one of the most exciting things that is actually happening. When we talk about innovation capital, I think this is also where it will come from. Um, we do a lot of um, social in, uh, social impact investment ourselves. We're pushing hard for social development bonds. We have an advocacy group at Tasha, which is pushing hard for social development bonds to be able to issue bonds which are based on outcomes of these social actions. While those places are, in, while those things are going through, I do think there is a need, if I may say this, for Indian businesses, Indian families, Indian wealth managers, Indian family offices to start contributing significantly larger than they do today philanthropically. I'm going a completely different route on this, so forgive me for that. I don't think we do enough of that. I don't think there's enough contribution happening as yet because there is a fear, of course, it has, we have not been, our history has suggested it's not like this wealth has been around for that long. Uh, but yet, I do think there is a way in which we should try and harness more of those capital because a country's own capital necessarily has to be at the front of this entire movement. They are the ones who know industry. They are the ones who work in agriculture. They are the ones who work in the villages. They know how, what the needs are and how we can push them and what may or may not work. So if you look at the big, huge examples of what has worked, on one side is Pratham in education, and the other side is Amul as a cooperative, which has worked. These are local homegrown solutions which need to evolve and need, need to be developed because it is hard, I find, Puneet, when I'm looking at investors and talking to them, for people to come in from the outside and understand all the idiosyncrasies and all the issues, for, for instance, around an agricultural supply chain, right? It's very hard when we invest in those companies Quite honestly, we're taking a shot in the dark because we also don't understand. It. Now, were we able to pick up on family homes or industrial groups which have deep interests in that, work with them to develop innovation funding in certain areas, work with them to set up seeds, work with them to set up funds? I think that's where I would suggest we should go. We need to look with inside home first. Uh, just as it has in the startup movement now. You know, a lot of the startups are being funded by domestic capital now. Um, and I hope in the social sector also, it can be fueled by wonderful family homes who have enormous wealth, which they should be able to give away and use at this point in time to seed a thousand other startups if they can. 
Yeah. Pramod, if, if I, you know, uh, thank you very much for that. I, I completely agree that I think the local, uh, it, ha it has to have local uh, patronage. If you don't get local patronage, I think it's very hard for us to be able to go out there and attract capital from the outside when we ourselves have not demonstrated that we believe in it and we're putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, so I completely agree that the local, you know, whether these are big family houses, trusts, foundations, corporates, uh, funds, whatever, whoever you might talk about, but they have to get into this thing. And, and I think there is certainly, uh, I must say that not to dismiss it, whilst we're, I'm disappointed that the pace hasn't uh, take, picked up as much, but I think there definitely have been some folks who've certainly gotten into it. But let's just uh, get to another point, and that is really on the human capital. You know, how do we leverage uh, tech talent to improve development, little indicators, and you know, and close in on the SDG goals. So, what do you, uh, what's your thought about that? And maybe you can, uh, you know, talk about that because you have some experience with your Skills Academy, and I know that a lot of stuff that you did while was getting these people fund them in that basic uh, education, but you also give them uh, a lot of tools uh, to, you know, to be innovative, et cetera. So how do you solve for that human capital? Yes. So I think here's, here's give you a few examples, if I may, uh, as you talk about uh, STG goals and you talk about uh, how do you deploy technology. So a recent platform, and, and, and I'm watching this happen in Delhi, by the way, Delhi, what, I'm not. I'm completely apolitical. I have no political agendas ever in my life. Never want to have. But you know, I'm watching what's happening with in Delhi with great admiration and joy uh, as to what's happening with schooling, etc. They've started a program called Rose Guard just now. It's got a million hits of jobs within a week for people looking for jobs, and it's got seven hundred thousand jobs being listed. So I think there are things like that which are huge enablers. If you look at a NASCOM future skills program, we have over 2 million people subscribed on this program. They're free of cost. They're available to anyone. Anybody can go out and look for them. So I think there is a thousand areas like that, Puneet, which would be very, very powerful where we can pull together all the free courses. By the way, by the way, you can crowdsource curriculum if you wanted to. Crowdsource curriculum and have it available to people. I totally agree with Arundhati's point that, okay, many people don't have broadband, et cetera. But you know, that will take time. I agree. But in the meantime, I'll tell you, when there is a great program, it is also amazing how people do find their way around it or find ways. And the government can help and all of us can help. We can provide laptops. We can provide local area bandwidth. We can provide dongles. We can do a lot of stuff. But I think providing these kinds of programs through technology platforms is fantastic. Let me, let me go to a few other areas. Financial inclusion. We're still all experimenting with, with the holy grail of algorithms, right? In artificial intelligence. Clicks Capital is a fintech company, digital lender. Uh, we're all struggling with who is going to find the algorithm that allows us to lend to 85% of India, which is in the unorganized sector. By the way, none of us serve them. None of us adequately serve them. We're beginning to now with SMEs and individuals, but the broad bunch of them are not served and they borrow from other places. So trying to build networks for that, which really make a huge difference in terms of healthcare, in terms of education, in terms of financial inclusion. These are huge movements that need some momentum. This is also where governments and particularly state governments individually can play a huge role. If you look at, again, what's happened in Delhi, you know, government schools for the first time beat private schools in, in school leaving marks. I mean, what an amazing statement, right? They've beaten private schools. All the government. <laughs> uh, and how have they done it? Is very simple blocking and tackling, not magic, not rocket science, very simply getting stuff done. So I, I'm very hopeful that actually technology is probably the best way to uh, meet those goals and get our tech talent to think about it. Um, I'm sure Arundhati has many thoughts on this. Yeah, I would love to get your thoughts, Arundhati, because yeah. I know you have come to Singapore, and when you came to Singapore, you were in a room full of these private bankers, 
And Piyush Gupta from DBS was asking this question about how to nurture talent or build the ecosystem, particularly when your hands are tied working for, you know, a public sector bank like State Bank, where you can't, where your ability to hire people laterally and just go out and make offers that so that the freedom that the private banks had, and you really built a huge powerhouse of talent. So I'm very keen, and I'm sure our viewers here would love to uh, hear from. I'm going to say one thing, and Arundhati, this is for you. When I ran the SBI credit card business, then I built that joint venture, and we ran it for many years. I learned that the talent in SBI is better than anyone, is as good as any. Ain't no private bank I met who could compete with all the top people at SBI. I'll tell you, it was phenomenal. Just want to leave that with you, Arundhati. I'm a great admirer of yeah, you. That's fine. Hey, you got a fan going. No, no, I think, you know, this needs to be mentioned that, you know, it is only after State Bank took over the management of SBI cards that we started making profits. And today we've just listed SBI cards and you've seen the results. So, yeah. you know, without a doubt, we know how to do things in our country much better than anybody else from outside can do it. That That's a fact. Although uh, we used to do much earlier, <laughs> then it bombed in between. So I have the history. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but uh, having said that, you know, I think, that. People, no, no, I think two or three things that I must mention. One is regarding, uh, you know, skilling and technology platforms. Uh, for instance, again, uh, Salesforce has a platform called Trailhead. And this is a totally free gamified um, platform for learning and for IT um, skilling. And uh, today, outside of the U.S., it's in India that we have the maximum number of people certified on Trailhead. So almost something like one and a half million developers have actually got themselves certified out of India. And we are working with the National Skill Development Mission in order to see how this can be taken forward further. And just as Mr. Basin was saying, Pramod was saying, there are a number of companies that have excellent platforms that can actually be easily leveraged if we can collaborate and leverage this in order to you know, give the right kind of inputs to the people who are interested in getting them. And uh, I know of a lot of other IT companies who are willing to do the same and who have similar platforms. The second thing that I would like to say is in respect of you know, uh, technology, Today, technology is actually solving the problems of financial inclusion that again Pramod was talking about. I don't know whether you all have heard of the platform called Sahai. It's on the same lines, you know, like uh, Aadhaar and UPI. So it will probably be a government uh, managed platform. But you will be able to build on those credit rails in order to be able to give small value, small duration loans very, very quickly. So what this platform basically does is it pulls together all of the data for a particular person and with that data provides it to the lenders for them to have a very quick look as to whether this is something that I can quickly underwrite. So, you know, if you're looking at the small Kirana shops, the coaching classes, the small schools, you know, you can name any kind of business and actually they can be on it and they can actually leverage these platforms very, very easily. So the fact is, you know, technology can definitely ensure that the problem of scale that we have in India, because of which we have so much of haves and have nots, because of which we have not able to give in the resources in order to get all the services out to the people that gets taken care of through the tech platforms. And actually speaking, if you're looking at financial inclusion again, again, from my SBI uh, stint, I must say this that it's not as though we were not trying to do financial inclusion, you know, uh, from say about 15 years back. From 15 years back, we had been trying to solve this problem, but we couldn't. It is only five years back when this entire project was taken up of uh, Prime, Prime Minister's Jandhan Yojana that we actually cracked it. And one of the reasons we could crack it was because of the Aadhaar platform. Because for the first time, the know your customer, which is absolutely basic to opening a bank account, that was not a challenge because just with a fingerprint and with your Aadhaar number, I could understand that A is A and B is B. That A is not, you know, fudging his, his or her name in order to appear as B. So I could actually identify the identity of a person which is so necessary for banking services 
we could actually get a hold of that with the aadhar platform so you know technology and business in fact have hugely hugely enabled us to bring those services to all the nooks and crannies of the country which we could not do earlier and there is no doubt about it that technology can even now do much much more so if you're looking at healthcare for instance and today we are in a health crisis and we know how difficult it is so we have just you know uh, launched a platform with uh, which deloitte actually has uh, enabled and this is done on the salesforce platform for one of the state governments and that platform enables that state government to manage all of its hospitals to understand when a patient is going in what is the treatment given being given what is the outcome for the patient not only that what are the hospital supplies that are required how many people what are the resources medicines everything else that is required you know all of it can be done on those platforms now frankly speaking earlier if you looked at hospital management it was a very very fragmented kind of a thing and again a result of that was total inefficiencies on the ground today you can take out much of these inefficiencies by going through these platforms so technology you know you if you use it well it's a question of how you use it if you use the technology well there is absolutely no reason why the many problems that we have in this country and the primary problems of education skills uh, health and jobs why we cannot resolve it to a very great extent so yeah. that's all if i may one thing please think, please go ahead one other element i would add is cost the cost of technology has gone down tremendously okay and frankly the 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 older erp systems and all of that now you have so much available which you can build much faster it's becoming more ubiquitous ultimately i hope it's like electricity you should be able to plug into technology use it as you want and then move on and that day is not far away by the way it's 3 to 5 years i would tell you and you don't need all these sophisticated applications etc we are building a new company i'll tell you we've got I, I i built it at a fraction of the cost i would have paid 10 years ago not a fraction of literally a tenth of the cost uh, because you can now deploy it and that i hope helps the developmental sector because that cost has reduced so much and makes the services that you're selling also so much cheaper yeah no and that's a, that's i think this whole notion of where the cost has coming down and hence the proliferation of that would be a lot easier because you now lower the barrier of adoption rapidly but the one other thing that is uh, you know kind of adjunct to that is this whole notion of community trust then because listen the jam trinity which is like what arundhati you de- described the guide rails right that kind of allowed us to then build all this infrastructure on top of that because that was done by the government right the people adopted it but what about the role of the private sector how about the private sector participating in building all of that because if we leave it to the government only then i think it you know uh, i spent a lot of time in the us and uh, you know we never ever think of the government in singapore of course government comes first but the singapore is a very very small place so it's almost uh, the government inc over here so how do we actually get the uh, the private sector to come in because the challenge of the private sector coming in is really the trust deficit so how do you actually get that community trust built in which you have with the government actually you know if i just may talk about this jam trinity that you're talking about the upi and currently the credit rails that have been built they've actually been built by volunteers in the private sector and then handed over to the government for management so it's not as though it's been built on government money it's been built with private money all of this you know i know one of the institutions that's been working on it and it's mentored by mr nilkeni and obviously it's all you know all done with private capital it's not done with government capital yes the subsequent management and the subsequent looking after is done by the government so i don't really think that you know private sector involvement is not there there is one other thing that i really want to mention and i uh, i'm taking 2 minutes of your time there is a question on that as well one of the things that has come up is the fact that you know in the developmental sector we don't see the kind of talent that we see for instance in the it sector the reason for that is obviously the difference in the remuneration or the emoluments okay and there you know if i go back to my own uh, in, involvement 
in these NGOs, I find there is one very big issue. And that issue is when somebody makes a donation, they want to make sure that each and every penny of the donation goes to the reason for which this NGO has been set up. Say, for instance, this NGO has been set up in order to look after uh, street children. So they want to know how many street children have got impacted, what is the exact amount of money that we are spending on the street children. However, what nobody is really donating for is the infrastructure that is required in order to run this NGO. So, you know, the expenses for the office, the expenses for keeping track of all of this, the expenses for, you know, whatever is the, the materials that are required to be given or the pedagogy that needs that needs to be developed. Very little money goes towards this. Now, unless and until we understand that even these companies need good talent and good talent will not always come because they have a volunteering mind space. Many of them will come if they feel that it's a satisfying job and if the remuneration is right. Maybe at one point of time, they won't need remunerating. But when they are starting out, when they are young, they do need to build their uh, own lives. So they do expect something. Now, if that is not allowed to them, then you are going to get talent that is very, very low. You will get talent that is extremely passionate and extremely good, but the numbers are very small. But the general administration and the general looking after is left to people who are remunerated very poorly. I think we need to change this mindset because if we don't change this mindset, it's going to be very difficult for the development sector to attract the kind of talent that it actually needs. Yeah. That's a very good point. I, I, and I know you mentioned that technology is just an enabler and however, you know, changing mindset is a very, very big thing. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Pramod, any last comments from you? Any thoughts from you? Yeah. I think on this last topic, you know, the models I would use is certainly not America, where I think government has often failed to provide basic services, even though it's the richest country in the world, right? Uh, it's astonishing uh, when you look at some of those models. Having said, I would look at Scandinavia and Germany. They, the models they have deployed are actually fantastic. They have great governance. They provide great services. Their healthcare systems work. Their social baskets work. Their pensions work. They're very rich, of course. Very different. But the structure of what they provide is actually very, very strong. So I would, one, definitely think about it from that perspective. Two, the government does have to play a huge role in India. We will continue to do so. But the process of implementation and execution within the government has to improve significantly. Look, Adhar happened because of Nandan, right? I mean, he made it happen, but he was given all the power to Indeed. invest, get on with it, and do it, right? He was a minister level. Uh, similarly, now they're putting up a healthcare platform, they're putting up other platforms. But you know, you need to bring in private people into the government. There are thousands of volunteers. I do a lot of work. I'm doing some work with the Punjab government now. I'm doing work with the Delhi government now. There are thousands of us who would gladly give up our time. But the government and the civil servants need to allow access to people to be able to use their expertise Otherwise, you're not going to blame, get to the point of delivery that you need because it cannot cover, you know, transportation one day, banking the other day, and heavy industry the third day, and steel and skilling another day. It doesn't work. And I think that is a lesson for all of us. Indeed, indeed. I'm getting a notification from the organizers that I'm running out of time and I would love to have gone on. And I'm sure the audience here would have loved to listen to this conversation. But thank you. Thank you very much, Arundhati. Thank you, Pramod, uh, thank as you. always, for a wonderful conversation. And thank you to the Nudge Foundation. There are some questions, Arundhati and Pramod, that our viewers have asked. And so uh, we'll send that to you and perhaps get them answered offline. But thank you very much.